I felt like last week with the news, I lost the thread on what was happening in the GOP primary. And a couple of things did happen. I want to get your take on it. One, we got the fundraising numbers. That's always interesting and a little bit of a tell. There was also news that Mike Pence, the former vice president, decided to skip the Nevada caucuses that's run by the state Republican Party. He basically said the rules had been set in favor of President Trump, so he's going to step away from that. But can you really win if your fundraising is low, as his is, relatively speaking, and deciding to skip Nevada altogether? Yeah, it's an interesting take to talk about skipping Nevada when it's uncertain whether the former vice president will even be in play when it comes to Nevada. You've got to get through Iowa. You've got to get through New Hampshire. You have to get through South Carolina, although there may be some jockeying of the schedule there. So I, it's interesting to hear him um, pontificate about being in the race. Um, I'd be focusing on Iowa, but this has been a point of contention in California, for instance. Arguments that the Trump folks have set the delegate count in their favor and just the team DeSantis coming in and trying to rearrange that. So you've got to have these kind of ground battles on how the delegates are allotted, because in the end, you have to have more delegates than the guy sitting next to you. Um, but I would be focusing on Iowa if I were the former vice president. OK. And what about some of the others in the race? There, there was a poll, I think it was Fox News poll last week that had Tim Scott quite low. Yeah, Tim Scott at 2% is what he is at in the Real Clear Politics average nationally. And I mean, when you look at Iowa, a place where Tim Scott should naturally resonate, he's currently Real Clear Politics average in fifth place at 6%. Ramaswamy's overtaken him. Haley, DeSantis still at number two. New Hampshire. He's Even Chris Christie, I believe, in, in some cases, in Chris some Christie cases. was ahead. And then in South Carolina, you know, his home turf, Real Clear Politics average, he's number four. Um, so he's an optimistic candidate. I've always said he has a message like no one in the race, but you got to make that message take off and translate into polling. OK, then let's talk about a couple of the others. Doug Burgum of North Dakota, still not making any movement, but he has a new gas card plan in order <laughs> to keep on the on the debate stage. Can you explain to people what it takes to get on the debate stage for this third Republican debate? So for the third Republican debate, which is taking place November 8th in Miami, you have to have four percent in two national polls or 4% in one national poll plus two states. And then, yeah, and I just, just to explain, so that ratchets up from the second debate. Yeah. Meaning that, so it gets, it should conceivably get harder for people to actually make the debate stage. Conceivably, mm -hmm. but, and this is the candidate's word, this is not, you know, the RNC, the official law of the land here. You have DeSantis, Vivek, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, and Chris Christie saying, we've all qualified and met the 70,000 donor threshold, which, I thought your last question in the debate was so important. Mm -hmm. None of these candidates can win unless the others drop out. It's a simple game of math when you have the former president pulling in majority support. You've got to get others off the stage. And yeah. it doesn't appear for the third debate. I mean, maybe Bergram's off, but but other than that, these Bergram guys are is one of the things he's trying to do on the 70,000 is he's got a gas card thing. And look, and he's a smart businessman. Yeah. He's not spending the kind of money that maybe other candidates are on ads or other things, but he's figured out a way how to make the stage. I think the 4% national polling might be the thing that keeps someone like a Doug Burgum off the stage. I would think so. And, you know, with, with when you look at Tim Scott, I mean, he has 6% in Iowa, 9.8% six, in South Carolina. Again, real clear politics. Someone like him makes it, but Burgum not pulling in anywhere yeah. near that. So then let's talk about Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, because... I think a lot of people look to those two as having kind of the most momentum, relatively speaking. And of course, we're speaking at this time with President Trump having a 40 point lead on both of them. But Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley in this past week, she had a good debate you know, and good time coming out of the debate. Foreign policy is kind of in her wheelhouse. So she's been in the news and been able to have been decisive on that. Ron DeSantis, as the governor of Florida, was able to say, I'm going to bring my people home from Israel that want to come home. So where do you see those two in the race right now? This will be the most interesting dynamic to watch as we head into that November debate, because you have Nikki Haley, to your point, I mean, former UN ambassador. She can talk tough and, and has the actions and the record to back it up. And then DeSantis, as an executive of Florida, we haven't really seen them truly go head to head. This debate, I would watch for that. I mean, Nikki Haley punching at Ron DeSantis. She's number two in two of the early states now. She's beating DeSantis in New Hampshire and South Carolina. He's still ahead in Iowa, but look for him to take him down a few notches because this is this is her area. I mean, this is this is where Nikki Haley thrives. And Ron DeSantis is, is no stranger to foreign policy. Israel, he yeah. served, the only candidate on the stage who served. So I'm watching for that battle and who takes shots at who. And the other thing is, let's talk about Joe Biden for a moment because on the fundraising front, 
he had a decent quarter, mm-hmm. and but they're spending a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Now he has a war on his hands. He's commander in chief and pretty much getting decent remarks from most places right now, even from conservatives. Uh, but in some of those polls from last week, head to head, Nikki Haley was up four over Biden in a head to head matchup. I think Trump was maybe even and DeSantis was a little bit below. And Nikki Haley makes the case I'm the only candidate in the race that is outside of the statistical area of error that's beating Joe Biden. So um, it's an interesting argument, electability, but not an argument that's been particularly helpful to any one candidate with Trump still in the lead in the primary. Um, But, you know, we'll see. This is an interesting moment for Joe Biden because, as you know, his cataclysmic fall off in polling began with Afghanistan. People saw chaos. They, They felt there was a bereft of leadership. And Ukraine was unable to reverse that, though he's been steadfast in supporting Ukraine. Can support for Israel reverse that chaotic Afghan decline? A lot of people saying his words so far are good. But the problems at the southern border yes. are making people think, are we protected here at home? I think it's such a vulnerability for Joe Biden and for us yes. as citizens. And, and, and the argue, yes, the southern border and then the argument that he has enabled Iran. So it will be interesting to see if his steadfast support for Israel can reverse any of that, or does it just further add to the chaos on the world stage? My, my last thing in this segment I wanted to ask you about is the vice president's office, Kamala Harris. Her communications team has tried so hard <laughs> to have all of these articles written. About every four weeks, you get an article about how Kamala Harris is resetting her image or she's retrying or they're restarting. And this past week, there was two big profiles, one in the New York Times and the other in the Atlantic. Interestingly, Estad Herndon, who did the interview with Kamala Harris in the New York Times, he was meant to do two interviews with her. He asked some pretty basic questions, I thought. And Kamala Harris apparently was so offended or was put off by it that they never did the second interview. And that profile piece did not turn out well. Yeah, you never want to, uh, for lack of a better word, enrage the reporter who's <laughs> interviewing your boss. You try to work with or them. Or insult them. Or insult them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a vice president who presumably hopes to be commander in chief one day, you should be able to answer basic questions. Mm-hmm. But time and time again, we've seen Kamala Harris fail at this at this craft of answering questions, you know. With, when it came to the former vice president, Mike Pence, like, he always knew the answer to the question. He was leading a coronavirus task force. I, I watched it every day. You didn't worry about your vice president making simple blunders. But with Team Harris, she has to be carefully managed by her communication staff or you get profiles like this. And that's why, you know, and Nikki Haley always says this election that or this campaign is really against Kamala Harris, not Joe Biden. Very and smart. I imagine that she will continue to say that. Yes. Okay. We do not have a speaker of the House. Do you think we'll have a Speaker of the House by the time this podcast records next Monday? We better. We better. Uh, When you look at the polling, it it was interesting. Um, Among independents and among Republicans, most did not care about the Speaker battle that played out. They didn't think it was particularly significant. But you start to care when you reverse look at this and say, okay, Republicans in Congress could have censured Rashida Tlaib, could have pushed Joe Biden to freeze the $6 billion dollars, um, could have taken any number of measures in aid package for Israel. When you look at the things you could have been doing and the message you could have been setting, and instead we're talking about Jim Jordan or, you know, five days ago, Steve Scalise, that's a big problem. You're losing the messaging battle and losing the battle, in fact, by not being able to put the pressure on this. And country. also, like, think of the things the Republicans were trying to push on uh, either defense spending or Bidenomics, let alone the investigations into Hunter Biden. And they have an impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden, of which you haven't even heard anything about in two weeks. No, there is one hearing and then it just went away. Uh, so and, and interesting, interesting if this Jim Jordan play doesn't work out. Do you ever empower a Hakeem Jeffries who will make sure that impeachment inquiry is buried? There's a lot of interesting things about the question of because the margins are so tight. I think I've t- said on this podcast before, but I'll say it again because it's pretty funny. About three months ago, I saw Kevin McCarthy and... He, he looked thinner to me. And, and I said, are you getting enough to eat? Do you look like you're losing weight? And he said, oh, yes, some people think I'm on Ozempic, but I tell them I'm on the five-seat majority diet oh, like, because things are so tight and it's so close. And so yeah. there could be a need for Democrats to either sit back and not vote that day for speaker or to be more affirmative. And I wonder about some group like the Problem Solvers Caucus. If there were ever a time to help solve a problem, now would be it. But they always seem to fade into the woodwork when the actual votes take place. They do. They do. And that's why you've had some members say, why am I even a part of this? We're we're not solving much of anything at all. But um, now would be the time to solve something. I'd love to see the Republican majority do that. But 
to your point about the Kevin McCarthy diet, that, that's really humorous, um, but sadly true. Um, this is the consequence of no red wave. We didn't have a red wave. And the consequence is a narrow majority. And the consequence is members that don't represent the whole, like Matt Gates and others being empowered to exert their voice in a way that could ultimately be counterproductive. Yeah. So that is, I guess, Tuesday of this week, which would be tomorrow. We will see a little bit more. So uh, bear with us as we f- cover this speaker's race. In the meantime, I also wanted to ask you about the Senate races and the ones that you're paying attention to, because I think that conservatives and Republicans for a while, they think, well, if we just fight all the time and fight for what we believe in and have purity, then we will get the results we want. That is not true if you actually don't have the votes or the majorities in the House and the Senate or in the governor's offices. So as you look at the Senate races to come, what's your gut instinct about another red wave coming or is it going to be tougher than that? I, I, it's going to be tough. I mean, especially you have to look at the top of the ticket. And of course, that has implications for those down ballot. So if it's former President Trump, you know, what does that mean for the Senate races for a John Tester in Montana, for a Sherrod Brown in Ohio, um, for Joe Manchin in West Virginia? Uh, that will be an interesting one. Joe Manchin, particularly vulner- vulnerable when you've got someone as popular as Jim Justice on the other side. But how do those play into who's at the top of the ticket? And number two, Abortion ballot initiatives, you know, Ohio is a good example. This November, they're voting on that abortion ballot initiative. So it's before the Sherrod Brown. But race, Arizona's but likely to have one. Arizona, Florida is likely to have one. Iowa. Oh, is Florida too? Yes. That's apparently one that's in the works that could be there. And Florida's very red. Wow. But nevertheless, yes, there's Arizona, Florida, Iowa, Pennsylvania. Not sure yet. They still have to get signature drives in, but there is one being considered. Florida prohibit laws restricting abortion initiatives. So that's coming from Planned Parenthood. Probably. Wow. Or the left. Or no, the left. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's very interesting. I knew that Arizona would, but Florida as well. I mean, Florida's and one. maybe it's red enough that it doesn't matter, but we've seen when these initiatives, yep. at least on their own in Kansas, Ohio, Wisconsin, they end up winning on that side. And they have to get the signatures, but Pennsylvania too, another one to watch. Okay. So I, I wanted to ask you about Pennsylvania because this is you know, the Republican dream is that they're going to win Pennsylvania one day. But interestingly, in the Senate race there, Dave McCormick, who ran against Dr. Oz last time and just got pummeled in that primary by Dr. Oz, even by Donald Trump. He has just secured unanimous support from the Republican Party in Pennsylvania to be their nominee to run against Tom Casey, who is the incumbent there. Tom Casey doesn't have great numbers in the state. He's not disliked, but he's not really, there's no enthusiasm really behind Tom Casey. No one can name anything that he's actually done. So do you think that with Biden being vulnerable, with his polling numbers, Republicans sort of being on the march, whether it's with Donald Trump or another candidate, can a Dave McCormick win in Pennsylvania? Yes. And I had a a frantic text from a Republican operative ahead of Oz getting the nomination saying, Oz is going to lose. Mark my words right here, right now. He has so many vulnerabilities. McCormick needs to be the nominee. I have no power over that, but it was an interesting text to receive. Um, and in hindsight, say, if McCormick had been the nominee, if you wouldn't have had Oz, who, yes, had great name idea, but had the vulnerability of being people say, you live in New Jersey, you don't live in Pennsylvania, among some other comments, would, would we have a John Fetterman? Likely not. So, you know, McCormick will be interesting to watch and you won't have a gubernatorial candidate at the top of the ticket saying, you know, we want abortion without exceptions. That was a big vulnerability there, I think, for Oz and others in Pennsylvania. You do not speak for the former president any longer, that is an old job, but do you, and feel free to to tell me that this is not something you want to answer, but do you think President Trump, who was quite critical of Dave McCormick in the last election, will he leave him alone in this election? I think so. I yeah. think he has his I eye so on too. his own race. Um, and I think he realized in hindsight, some of the candidates that, that he supported, you know, didn't cross the finish line. Um, and he may argue, you know, oh, that's because abortion, you know, with no exceptions was what the gubernatorial candidate was arguing there. So he he has his reasons for saying that person lost. But I, I think he's going to be focused on winning the White House. And then Arizona, Carrie Lake, who ran for governor, did not win, although insisted that she won. But now she has decided to throw her hat in the ring for the Senate race in Arizona. That's a curious Senate race because you have Kirsten Sinema running as an independent, Ruben Gallego running as a very far left progressive, and Carrie Lake, who is considered a very far right Republican, though her record would not exactly say that. And she has tempered her language in her announcement saying that I just want to get to better kitchen table economics. I want to focus on making sure that Arizona is safe in regards to the southern border. And I'm wondering what you think about that race. 
Yeah. So she, interesting. Like her, her announcement speech was very tempered, very different, less backward looking, mm-hmm. focusing on the last election and vote count and more forward looking. You, you can win when you do that. And I think a lot of these candidates from Kerry Lake on down are going to be looking up to the top of the ticket. Former President Trump, who has a great record to stand on, not looking backward, not looking to 2020, not relitigating old battles and looking forward as a united Republican But can President party. Trump do that? That's the question. I, I think he can. I've seen him be very disciplined. He can be disciplined when he wants to be. He can be disciplined. But if, if, you're, if, if people were actually seeing a lot of the tweets that he, or the posts that he has on Truth Social, which the people, a lot of people do not see, yeah, uh, I think maybe what people would wonder if you, that's possible. You would wonder. Right now, for instance, you know, if I were still advising my former boss, I'd say, you have the Abraham Accords. You had, right. you had the first time in a quarter of a century that peace deals in the Middle East. You have the record to contrast with Biden. And if you use that megaphone as a nominee to just make this a choice, not a referendum on yourself, but a choice vis-a-vis right. Joe Biden, you can, you can win this thing. And I think a lot of Democrats are thinking, how could it possibly be? How would anybody ever vote for Trump again? And Guy Benson had an interview with a woman in a, she was his Uber driver in Milwaukee after the debate, black woman who wanted to talk politics with him. And she said that she would never vote for Trump and she would never vote for a Republican, but that she could see why a lot of people in her family would, Mm -hmm. because she said life for them two years ago was a lot better than it is today. And a lot of people will be making that calculus in their mind. I might not personally like this person. However, the economy is so bad, the world feels chaotic. And I can tell you, you will have a a, a very enthusiastic 30% block that shows up for Trump. Rain, shine, sickness, health. Joe Biden doesn't have that kind of 30% mobilization. So it will be interesting to see how that happens and how third-party candidates like a a Kennedy polls. And also last week, RF Kennedy Jr. announced a third-party run. Well, I'm going to table that for another. Let's just see how that goes for a little bit because right now it doesn't have a lot of traction. And he fired his campaign manager in the first week of his announcement of going third-party. Uh, Dennis Kucinich is no longer his presidential campaign manager. His daughter-in-law is. Hmm. So, and it, it will be interesting to see <laughs> because he could pull in double digits That's according right. to some national polling. Talk about, a, talk about a spoiler, perhaps from both sides. Yes. This is why I love to ask my friends to come on the podcast because just like you told me something I didn't know about the Florida, the possible Florida referendum on mm-hmm. abortion, I'm curious what you think I could be missing. What are you looking at, the issues that you pay attention to? I think your take on things is so interesting as a young mom, a mom of young children, a young mom, but a mom of young children with the, all of the experience and background that you have and your ability then to communicate to millions of people every day here at Fox News, what are you paying attention to that I might be missing? So you're not missing this because we text about it, but I think Republicans are missing it. You know, you flagged for me an article by Mark Thiessen in the Washington Post that was fantastic about a pro-family agenda. Republicans are missing the ability to do that. Marco Rubio, I, I'd appoint him as head of the Republican family agenda because it's not just Unborn Child Support Act that he's put forward. He actually wants to expand support for women for special supplemental nutrition program. The reason I bring that up, I was um, at a pro-life facility and they said to me, we can't tell you the number of women who come into us who want to keep their baby, but say, I haven't eaten in three days because I only get to eat when I work at Pizza Hut. Mm. So imagine being a mother who's pregnant and you haven't eaten in three days. That shouldn't happen in our country. And you have Republicans Mm. who have plans for this, but we just don't talk about them. So that's number one. And number two, I would just say polling isn't as predictive as it seems to have been uh, of late when you look at the midterm elections. Um, Carrie Lake was supposed to win. Dr. Oz was supposed to win. None of those things happened. So we have to recalibrate the way we think about predicting these races when it comes to polling. And do you think that pro-life, pro-choice, of the whole abortion issue is the one that scrambles the polling or scrambles people's minds? <laughs> because it is curious that more Republicans and conservatives don't talk about a pro-family, pro-growth agenda. Yeah, it does scramble it. You know, talking to people on the ground, we said we saw on on the day Dobbs passed a spike in voter registration. They showed me a chart and it's young women. Gen Z showed up in high, high numbers. In fact, have you seen some of those numbers of turnout in the counties where there's a big major college campus? Yes. And and think in Wisconsin, it was something like 88% turnout, which 88% turnout, guys, is a, that's big. Yeah, 88% turnout is huge. And when you look at it, just flagging this New York Times, this is on Ohio, nearly twice as many people voted on the Ohio measure than cast ballots in primaries for governor, Senate, House, and other marquee state races. And that was a measure um, pertaining to abortion. So that that's pretty incredible that you have more people turning out to vote on a referendum than yeah. for governor. And what about the enthusiasm gap? I wanted to know if, what you think about that in terms of Biden's voters don't seem to be very enthusiastic, except they're enthusiastic about hating President Trump. 
That is right. This one NBC poll stood out to me. 38% of those who picked Biden said their choice was about supporting him. 58% said it was a vote against Trump. It was reversed, mirror image reversed for Trump. 56% say they're voting for him. 36% say it's a protest vote against Biden. So when you have people saying, I want to show up because I like you, that's what you want in politics. And the former president seems to have that. The current president does not. But maybe Israel, there's a million X factors that could scramble that. Last thing on polls, I know that um, like even Amy Walter, the Cook Political Report, she said that the polls are going to fluctuate a lot more than the electorate will in reality. She said most swing voters aren't thinking about 24 and they are dispirited and exhausted with politics. She thinks that we should save the fights about polling methodology and crosstabs until next year. This is a industry that's in flux Mm -hmm. as technology changes. Are there polls that you trust that you look to to say, okay, that might be the most accurate snapshot in time? Yeah, there are some like Pew or NORC who have bigger sample sizes that it looks to maybe more reputably. Um, But it's worth taking a hard look at, especially because these polls, and it's no fault of their own, you base your turnout model on past elections. But what have we seen with mail-in voting now much, much more utilized, the rules being more lax? It's harder to gauge turnout. Gen Z being motivated, no one expected them to actually turn out in the way they did. It's harder. The past is is not as predictive, perhaps, as it has been. All right. All right. Before we go, this is easy. It should be easy. We do a quick little (laughs) trivia thing, okay? So a pop quiz, and you can choose between three categories. Of these three, you could choose which one you want. Presidential potpourri, Dana Reed sports, or presidential pets? Oh, wow. Uh, Let's go with Dana Reed sports. Okay. (laughs) I wouldn't have known the answer to this, but you might because you've got sports in your family. All right. Since 1962, this NFL team has featured their logo only on the right side of the helmet. What team is this? I, oh my goodness. Okay, I can give you ABC. Kansas City Chiefs. Pittsburgh Steelers or Cincinnati Bengals? I'm going to go with Kansas City Chiefs and I regret my choice of questioning. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't know why. So stay tuned for next week when I will find out why Jason Bonewald made this trivia for me. And we will tell you (laughs) why Pittsburgh puts their logo only on the right side of their helmet. Kaylee Magnani, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.